So what is the, uh, the basic format of the class? So the basic format of the class um, are these, um, these lectures. So there's no, uh, there's no actual uh, text for the class. So um, in the past, and if you go to the web page, you can see there's a bunch of uh, standard neuroscience texts uh, listed there. And, um, and those are worthwhile texts. I'll, I'll say a, a little bit about that after I say what the, you know, what the main content of the class is. So the main content of the class are my lectures, which are recorded. So most of the content on the tests, great majority of it comes from, comes from the lectures. Um, I've got a bunch of readings there. Those are relatively technical readings, uh, relatively hard to do. Some of them are a little bit older. They're like sort of classics in, in the field, uh, sort of that defines sort of the main subparts of, of system neuroscience. Uh, I've also put a, a draft of my notes on there. It's, I don't know, it's like, uh, it's probably up to 100, 100 or so pages of of class notes that's a pdf there that you can download and i'll be updating that as uh, as we go along uh this this semester so so that's the so so the main content to concentrate on are, are the lectures and you can go and consult some of the readings um to sort of you know get a little deeper into things but uh, it's mainly the lectures so why not use a book well the books so those books, like you can see the Squire book or the Kendall book, those books are, are written by committees. Uh, and so they're, they're very long. They've got a lot of information in them. Uh, they're worthwhile having if you're interested in, in neuroscience. Uh, uh, but they're not, um, they're not very coherent because they're written by a committee of people. Uh, the level of the different chapters sort of goes up and down. The le level of specificity is wildly high in one chapter, and then it's kind of too general in, in another chapter. But nevertheless, th they're good to have. I used to require them, and the students would just complain. I just, you know, use this thing as a, as a weight to flatten papers or, you know, as, as a pillow. It, it wasn't very useful to me. So I also put some standard undergraduate texts there, and, and you know, it... it it's generally, it uh, wouldn't hurt to sort of take, take a look at some of those, but it, it, it's not required. Uh, I also put, there's, there's a very, a very good um, uh, book by Nievenhuis, a Dutch guy. Um, that's probably the best neuroanatomy book. The, it might be in fifth edition now, but it's, um, it's called The Human Central Nervous System. Uh, now, that book has got a ton of detail in it. It's got a lot of detail about connectional anatomy, mainly from animals, which is where most of the, the actual connectional anatomy comes from. If you open that book, you, 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 if, or if you buy that book, and you might say, wow, this is just doesn't help me. <laughs> it's way too much detail. Uh, but that's a, good, that's a very good anatomical reference book because it actually has very good drawings of the way these structures, what they look like uh, in, in the brain in it that were actually made from uh, serial sections. So, so that, that, that's a good reference book to have if you're sort of interested in, 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 in neuroanatomy. Um, so, that's, so that's the material. Mostly the lecture. There's a bunch of papers you can, you can take a look at. There's some books that you might want to buy used copies of, uh, but mostly the lecture. So, um, so what about the tests? So, so the tests basically are short answer tests, and I've got some examples from going on 15, 10, 15 years ago uh, there of what the tests actually look like. Uh, the current tests are about the same coverage and, um, and length. Uh, they, just, they have eight, eight questions on each test. There's two midterms and a final. The final is one and a half times. It has 12 questions instead of eight questions on it. Each question has a couple subsections to it. The answers to them are, you know, a short phrase or a, a small diagram. Um, and hopefully we'll be back in class and we can take these in class, although last year we did them, uh, did them offline. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, did them, did them at home. So, so that's, that's the test. For the undergraduates, that's the, um, that's the, uh, the main uh, content of, of the class. There's a short paper for the 
uh, for the graduate students, uh, five to 10 pages. And for that, I want uh, basically a review of just a couple papers that actually are looking at neurophysiological responses, mainly from animals. There's a little bit of human neurophysiology, but mostly animals, uh, or neuroanatomy. I don't want like a neuroimaging paper or just a general review of attention in the brain or something like that. I, wa I want you to go to the original neurophysiology or neuroanatomy um, literature. Look up, look up one of the original neuroanatomy or neurophysiology papers. Could be old, could be new, and, and give me a review of that. So I want you to read the original low-level uh, neuroanatomy and neurophysiology and review that. And you can, you can uh, email me uh, suggestions for papers that you might want to review. Obviously, the, the topic is completely open as long as it actually, you know, you look up something in Journal of Neuroscience or Journal of Neurophysiology. Uh, okay, so that's, um, so that's, that, that's the paper for the, uh, for the graduate students. So uh, as far as the lectures go, there's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m., um, and I'll keep the zoom on uh, now that we've fixed it uh, for the, uh, for the uh, at least for the beginning part, I if people are, are actually using that. And hopefully you'll actually be in the class after that. Um, so, um, so there's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 10, or 9 to 9.50. And then on Friday uh, at 8 a.m., there's an advanced lecture, uh, which won't be on the test, but has all different kinds of cool and unusual topics in it. And so if you want to, um, if anybody wants to come to the, uh, to the Friday at, um, what's it? Ah, okay. So, um, uh, the, um, uh, that 8 a.m. lecture, uh, is, is, is optional. Uh, the only time it won't happen is this Friday. So this is Wednesday. So next Friday, Th this coming Friday, no 8 a.m. lecture, but there will be uh, a 9 a.m. Uh, lecture. But all the Fridays after that, there'll be an 8 a.m. lecture as well. And anybody's welcome, welcome to come to that. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic uh, uh, format of the class. And I cover sort of you know, main things. And the, the, the final, final exam is during exam week. It's 8, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, and uh, um, I also, if, if you go to this, this web page, there's a handy one-page PDF syllabus that has everything, uh, everything on it. Uh, it's at the top of the, the Recording list, in progress. Um, top of the list of uh, lectures. So, so that's basically, the, um, uh, that, that's basically the, the format of the class. So what about the learning objectives? So I always say like the... A little ways back, the syllabus police got to me, and they I wrote up some had to write up exactly five uh, learning objectives but but what is you know what is really what's the, really the purpose of this class and you know, what, what what are we trying to do with uh, with this class so so basically and I usually introduce this by Sort of relating my own story of how did I learn neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. And the way I learned it is I, you know, when I was an undergraduate, there weren't any neuroscience classes really. So when I became a graduate student, I took a neuroscience class, neuroanatomy class, and I, you know, I sort of got a little bit out of it. And then and I took another neuroscience class and, uh, and then I took a third one, a very good one, which is a comparative neuroanatomy class with Phil Ulinsky. And then I TA'd that class five times. And so, so there was about like uh, five, six, seven, eight. I took eight neuroscience classes in a row. Um, and I can tell, like, when did I actually start remembering stuff? And I started remembering stuff after I TA'd the class three times. So that means I needed to go through the material, the same material, because I just went to the exact same lectures um, for that neuroanatomy class, because I just sat through the lectures five times, but it took me, it took me basically five times through the material, if you count the initial neuroanatomy classes, to to really remember it, where I could you know permanently remember it. So I, I don't. So can you learn you know 
basic neuroanatomy in this in this class you you can learn something about it but it's not going to stick and so if you if so so the purpose of this class is to sort of introduce to some of these things but you know to, to actually learn it you've got to just do it multiple times that's just the way the human brain is recalcitrant that's just the way just the way it works so what is the actual sort of basic content we're learning um, and every year i always say uh well you know it's the parts of the brain and and how many are there so a, a neuroanatomist friend of mine named Terry Takahashi, he's up at the uh, University of Oregon now, um, and I, many years ago, 25 years ago, sat down. We said, let's just, let's just figure out how many parts of the brain are there. And so we just, just took an afternoon, wrote everything down, and we subdivided it pretty finely. And the answer is, it's around 400. And then you've got about maybe 300 parts of the spinal cord. You probably don't even think of the spinal cord as like, you know, having many different parts, but it's got a whole bunch of different parts in it. And so, but just concentrating on the brain, there's 400 parts. So, so you know, that's, that's kind of a lot, but it's a finite number and it doesn't change, you know. It, that's the great part of it. You know, the brain is the same brain every year, so it hasn't changed. But the problem is, you know, they're connected up to each other and you kind of remember like, well, there's a lot of possible connections between 400 parts of the brain. Um, but um, but that's the size of the problem. It's about 400 parts, and they're connected up to each other, and they've got different different features, and that's a lot of things to remember. And you're not going to be able to remember it after just one time through this class. But that's okay. That's 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 normal. Okay. So so that's kind of the main learning objective. And what is the overall you know the overall approach? And you know, sometimes uh, I say this is this is sort of an engineering approach approach to the you know to understanding the brain, but it's not really engineering because to brain uh, I'll put engineering in quotes. It's not really engineering. What it is is um, engineering approach. If you were an engineer uh, with uh, biomaterials. Uh, because there's a lot of, you know, work in machine learning uh, that sort of does things that are so, sort of, you know, sort of neural-like, like deep learning, you know, backprop through a bunch of, a bunch of layers. That's very, very on brain like You know, you've got an NVIDIA card, you have a bank of NVIDIA cards, and they're running through the data set billions of times. The brain doesn't do that. The, the actual sort of machinery, the biomaterials of the brain operate much more slowly. Uh, and they're also way the, way the hell more complicated than an NVIDIA, an NVIDIA uh, uh, video card for, uh, for calculating machine learning. So what we really want is sort of engineering approach to the brain, but so you're an engineer, but you're stuck with biomaterials. And so that's really, that's really sort of encapsulates what, what we're trying to do. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, engineers talk about signals and systems, and we'll talk about uh, uh, talk about this kind of approach, sort of uh, thinking of the kinds of signals that are that are transitioning through the different sensory modalities and the motor output modalities. So, so that's our that's our basic approach. In addition to the 400 parts. <laughs> so, um, okay, so. What about actual neuroanatomy, like actual sections? So uh, if we were to actually have a uh, course in neuroanatomy, then what we would do is we would actually look at brain sections and try to identify things. And I always, I always say, like, you know, when in this class, you're going to see, you know, a lot of pictures where I'll say, like, you know, here's, here's a structure. And, um, you know, this, this structure, you know, projects off to this structure, and it, it gets input from you know, from, from this structure down here. Uh, and what, you know, the brain doesn't look like that. Certainly doesn't look like that. Some of my pictures will be a lot prettier than this, but, you know, obviously the brain doesn't look like that. And so what does the brain actually look like? So if you actually get a brain section, just look through a brain section, you know, you know what is it going to look like? Well, you know, there's a bunch of cells in there. And, you know, and then some of them are a little bit bigger like that and then there's you know there's a little fiber bundle and there's there's two different uh 
kinds of stains you can do. You can do a Nissel stain to get the cell bodies. Uh, and then you can do um, uh, you know, some kind of myelin or fiber stain, which doesn't see the cell bodies, it just sees the wires. There's diff different kinds of these. And so you might <coughs> separately have a myelin stain, and you could see there's actually a bunch of big fiber bundle going through that little gap. But if, if you look at any, if you just take a brain section, you can just pull one up on the internet and just look at it. You see, like, where are the parts? <laughs> I don't see the parts. <laughs> you know, and how do you actually see the parts? Well, you start to learn to recognize all these different little textures, and you can see, oh, that, that's actually a part there. I can see that part now. That sort of corresponds to one of these guys. <laughs> uh, so we're not going to do that very much. I'll show you some brain sections, what some of the real parts look like. Yeah, no, the reason we can't do that is because that's a whole other class. That's basically a whole other semester class of uh, like five hours a week of just looking at these sections until you actually sort of start to recognize them. And that's a good thing to do, but we can't do that here. I'll just give you a little sniff of what it looks like. And finally, over the years, it took a very long time, there started to be good online atlases where you can actually look through uh, sections online. It took a very long time for that to, to get there, but it's, it's here now. So there's, there's a number of atlases out there that you can, you can take a look at. Um, but it's nothing beats actually having a section with nothing labeled on it, and you look at it and you say like, well, where's the part? I'm supposed to find this part. You know, that's, that's kind of the best, the best way to do it still. Okay, so uh, <coughs> why take notes? So this is something I always uh, say every year. Well, we've got this great video lecture recording system. Uh, it, uh, you know, you can make, you, you can see it very clearly. The videos are a little more interactive because I'm sort of looking at you instead of seeing my back on the board. Um, and, and that's all good, um, but I still encourage you to take notes. Now, it just seems so primitive. Like, why, why am I trying to copy, you know, copy what the, the person is actually drawing on the board when I got a good copy there? I, I got a good video copy. And it's actually worthwhile taking notes. When I go to lectures now, I take notes. Why do I take notes? Well, it turns out I've just discovered empirically if I don't take notes, I don't get much out of the lecture. So the, the, the actual sort of activity of trying to capture some good stuff that you saw and write it down is actually really important for, you know, for human cognition and memory. And so do I ever look at those notes? Actually, I don't, because I'm not being tested on them, at least <coughs> directly on them. Uh, and so I just have a giant stack of notes. <laughs> I could take careful notes on a lecture, and then I just put it in a pile. I r rarely look at it again. But I do it just because it actually makes me remember the stuff better. And so even though we have all these sort of fancy methods of recording, uh, recording the lecture, uh, it, it's, it's still, still worth taking notes. So I encourage you to take, take notes anyway and make drawings. And one of the things you think about, like, w w when you make a drawing, w what do you do? You've got to visit every part of the thing that you saw. So if you just look at an object, you might saccade to it a couple times and then you're out of there. But if you draw it, you've got to look at this part of the object, draw it, look at this part of the object, draw it. And so it actually makes you visit all the different parts of a, of a diagram uh, conceptually. And so that's another sort of, uh, you know, interesting reason to draw things, to actually sort of like, you know, make a drawing, make a copy of something. Um, okay, so class topics. So let's, um, let's go over the topics quickly. So... Basically, uh, we start off uh, with uh, cellular physiology. That'll be tomorrow, uh, when, uh, Friday, cellular physiology. So, and we'll talk about, you know, resting potential, action potential, dendritic uh, potentials, synaptic potentials, uh, LTP, how does, S, you know, STDP, how, how, how does, synaptic weight change actually occur, basic neurotransmitters. So there's, there's a whole bunch of topics there. You, you can see them in the, in the syllabus. And uh, it turns out uh, this is, you know, pretty complicated stuff. There's a lot of work, you know, on trying to, especially by drug companies, trying to sort of make all different kinds of drugs that will mess around with your neurons. Uh, 
Um, so uh, I won't go through all the extremely detailed channel stuff. We'll try to sort of hit the main the main points of how this works. But again, what we're trying to do is get a real intuitive feeling, like as if you were a neuron. Like how, how do these things, you know, what is the, you know, how do they actually work just physically uh, with, you know, ions and membrane potentials and physically changing membrane proteins. So, so that's basic cellular physiology. We'll talk a little bit about how dendrites work, electrical models of how dendrites work. And then, then what we do is we suddenly change over to simple uh, neural models. And uh, why that? Uh, didn't, didn't Marty just say, you know, simple neural models were a, t a terrible model of the brain? <laughs> I did. <laughs> and um, so why, why are we going to talk about that? Uh, we're going to talk about that partly uh, when, in, in the second half of the lecture when I start, you know, talking about some sort of folk theories of the, of the brain. This is the way you think. You think using these simple, physical, often physical analogies. And these simple neural models are, are just tools for thought. How do you sort of think about how some parts of the brain, uh, the brain work? And we'll go over simple models of Hebbian learning, so like you know where you you change synaptic strengths based on correlations, and simple models where you've got everybody connected up to everybody. What kind of like dynamical behavior do you get out of out of a model like that? And then, and then I'll talk a little bit about sort of the giant raft of machine learning type models. What do they look like? And and, and in particular, how are they different from you know from actual neural biological uh, learning. Um, but it turns out these guys, you might think of these guys as complicated because they've got some math in them. These guys are way simpler than this. This is just unbelievably more complicated than, than these models. Now, you might think, well, why don't we just sort of concentrate on the, com on the complicated stuff? Well, it's so complicated that we, it's, it's, it just boggles the mind trying to sort of actually imagine how it works. And so these are kind of like our current folk theories of, of how the brain work and how the brain works, and so, uh, so, so that's why we suddenly go to these simple neural models after talking about the cellular physiology. So then we talk about neural development, uh, and I know a lot of you are probably interested in development. So this could easily be a whole other course on its own uh, of how how does the um, how does the brain develop? But we'll cover it in two lectures, <laughs> the main points. And um, so that's, that's neural, neural development, starting, starting with the early embryo. How does the neural tube form? Where are the main parts of the brain? How does it establish a coordinate system for the brain? So, um, so then we'll start with the main sensory modalities. And so we'll start off with the visual system. I spent a lot of time working on the visual system, uh, and uh, the visual system is the is the biggest system in the in the primate brain. It's not the biggest system in, say, a bat. Bat's visual system is not so good, or a mole. Uh, you know, moles more interested in touching things, but in primates, the visual system is by far the biggest. It's actually about four times bigger than the other sensory systems. Uh, so if you look at you know, what are the main parts of the brain? We've got the visual system, which is about half, and then you have the auditory system, which is about one-eighth, the somatosensory system, the touch system, and, and muscle sense system is about one-eighth, the motor system is about one-eighth, and the, and the limbic system involved in sort of, you know, internal regulation and emotions and things like that is about another one-eighth. So the visual system is by far, so the visual system is, is as big as the auditory, somatosensory, motor, and limbic system put together. So it's, it's huge in, in, in a primate. So we'll spend more time on that than on the other uh, sensory modalities. Uh, then we'll talk about the uh, somatosensory system. So a somatosensory system is uh, the system of touch and sort of sensing where your limbs are by measuring the length of your muscles, things like that. 
Uh, and a little bit about uh, somatosensory plasticity. Uh, then we'll talk about the auditory system. And the auditory system is different than these visual and somatosensory system, the way the receptors work. It's fundamentally different geometrically. It's a line instead of a, a surface. The visual system has like a two-dimensional surface on it. The auditory system has just, just a line of receptors. So auditory system is quite different. And in the auditory system, we'll talk about um, bats and owls. So, uh, so owls have an extremely good auditory system. They, they, you know, birds were the remaining dinosaurs, and they evolved basically to eat all these small mammals that were that were uh, suddenly came up. And so, they're, so they've got like super tuned auditory systems. And uh, similarly with bats, bats actually perceive the world through their auditory system. So they have an extremely good auditory system, even though they got a little pea brain, tiny brain, but a very good auditory system. Um, so why are, we gonna, why are we looking at this? Well, in, in the bat, in the, in the owl case, we'll look at sort of how the, the auditory system plays around with maps of different kinds. Uh, it actually constructs a map of space uh, from these auditory frequency signals. Uh, with bats, um, bats are trying to use their auditory system to, to find their way around the environment, uh, but they actually... Uh, they actually have to solve some engineering problems that are similar to what humans have to solve, for instance, to recognize speech. So uh, you can recognize my speech, even though the sounds that define my different vowels are a little bit lower than if I was uh, a smaller person with a smaller uh, vocal tract, so, or, a, or you know, a child with a very small vocal tract. And so... So it turns out certain of the engineering problems of trying to recognize bat signals tend to have close analogy to recognizing speech signals. And so, and, but we've been able to actually study bats in great detail and figure out how some of the, uh, how some of the cortical areas uh, work that are involved in, in detecting these things. So that's the auditory system. Then we talk about the motor system. And it turns out a big chunk of the motor system is involved in, in eye movements. So you have a very sensitive fovea at the center of, center of gaze, and so you devote a large chunk of the brain, I mean, it's a sizable chunk of the brain, to just moving your eyes around, trying to figure out what to look at next. And that's a major sort of motor, series of motor structures that goes throughout, you know, there's a whole bunch in, in the cortex and down in the, in the brainstem and the basal ganglia, down in the... Um, down the superior colliculus, there's a ton of stuff there. It's all, all very nicely integrated. So we'll talk a lot about eye movements. Um, um, then we'll talk about some of the other major structures, the cerebellum and the striatum. Those are um, structures uh, in the brainstem uh, involved in movement. And the cerebellum in particular, most people sort of think of the cerebellum as just some sort of movement stuff. I don't really, it's not very cognitive. Cerebellum has expanded more in primate evolution than the cortex. Uh, if you look at a, at a, at a primate, like a, like a monkey, non-human primate, cerebellum is maybe about one-third the surface area of the cortex. In, in a human, it's like 90% the surface area of the cortex. So the cerebellum is blown up quicker than the cortex has, has, has blown up uh, in, uh, in primates, in humans, compared to other non-human primates. So cerebellum is actually interesting place. So then we'll talk about uh, the limbic, what we generally call the limbic system. Uh, so the limbic system is, and we'll concentrate particularly on some of the uh, work over the past 20, 30 years in the hippocampus and the anterorenal cortex and different parts of the, the hypothalamus that are involved in uh, figuring out where the animal thinks it is. So, like, what, what direction is my head pointing? You know, where am, I in the, where am I in the environment? So you think of the limbic system often as, like, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but a larger part of the limbic system is involved in, in sort of not... So you, you have a part of the, the limbic system says, like, you know, I'm hungry now and I need to go out and get some food. That, that's an important part. But a much bigger part is actually, this is where I am right now. This is my internal state, and I'm, I'm sort of 
I'm in this part, I'm right in front of the learning glass, uh, I can see the camera. Um, that and my head is, is pointed sort of that way in the room. That's a very large part of the, of the limbic system and there's, uh, there's a lot of really interesting work on that, so we'll, we'll concentrate on that. And then finally, uh, a couple lectures on neuroimaging. So if you, if you because obviously that's, uh, we have an MRI magnet here that I, I take care of and so neuroimaging is important to me. I have a whole class on this if you really wanna know how it works, but we'll just go over a few main main points of different kinds of neuroimaging. Okay, so that's the, that's our, that's our, our basic topics for the course. And there, you know, the, the, the test will be sort of, you know, uh, first part of the class, you know, some visual somatosensory, some auditory motor uh, that will mainly be on the final. So the final will have uh, some comprehensive questions and then some questions from the, the last third of the class. Okay, so now let's, for something completely different, uh, let's just talk a little bit about kind of folk theories of the brain. So what do we mean by, you know, folk theories? And that's a word, you know, that philosophers of science have used, and I actually got my degree in philosophy. I, my PhD is in philosophy of science, actually. Uh, and so this is kind of like a philosophy, little philosophy of science lecture, but we're talking about like, you know, how do we understand the brain? It's got 400 parts, they're all connected up to each other. You know, how do we, how do we kind of visualize this or, or just think about it? And um, I'd like to sort of go back to earlier attempts to think about it. And, you know, it, if you've ever read any philosophy, you know, you know, Aristotle was this Greek philosopher, uh, and he had some ideas about how the brain worked. And you might think, well, these were stupid. But the reason we talk about these is because it's interesting to sort of see how they were thinking about the brain. And so how were they thinking about the brain? Well, Aristotle actually, back in the day, philosophers actually used to do math and they used to do uh, dissection. So Aristotle, Aristotle dissected a pig, a pig brain. So. And, you know, if you ask somebody, not just the pig brain, the, the whole pig body. And so, so if you ask them, you know, if you just go someplace, like I would say, where, where somebody, somebody hasn't seen a cell phone, or maybe, maybe they've only seen this kind of, this is my cell phone. Um, they've only seen this kind of uh, cell phone. Um, and ask them, like, where does thought occur? Well, of course, everybody knows it's in the head. Uh, you can find skulls where people were drilling into the head, you know, 50 or 100,000 years ago, trying to, you know, do whatever, maybe let something out, put something in. So everybody knows that, you know, cognition is occurring in the head. But Aristotle, taking a cue probably from early steam engines. So the Greeks were fiddling around with steam, like, you know, boiling steam and causing steam to shoot out of jets and rotate things. So they, they actually sort of had some very sort of primitive steam engine-like devices. That's probably what Aristotle was actually using. So he was taking an analogy from some existing thing uh, that humans had made, and he was analogizing it with how the brain works. And his theory was, so he, he dissected a pig, and you could see, like, here's the pig brain up here, and you could see all these uh, large vessels coming up uh, to, the, to the brain. He didn't really know whether they were carrying air or carrying, you know, blood, wasn't, wasn't quite sure. But his idea was that the seat of cognition was the heart. And, you know, there's, there's some precedent for you sort of have feelings in your gut and your stomach and your heart, you know, when something, something big hits you. But his idea was that the heart was like a boiler and it boiled the blood. And then it, it, it boiled the blood and the blood, the water vapor went up into the brain, and uh, here's, here's, the, here's the pig. It went up into the brain, and, the, um, and then the brain was like a condenser. And the brain condensed it, you know, back into liquid, and then that would then go back down and go back into the heart. So not a very good theory, sort of steam engine theory of the brain. But that's, this is the way people think. We still think this way. 
So don't, you know, don't make fun of Aristotle. This is like, this is like a theory. It's a, it's a testable theory. It wasn't right. But uh, um, now let's, you know, a, a, another person who wrote about the brain was Descartes. Now, if you've studied any philosophy, you probably know, like, Descartes had this idea that there was physical substance and then there was mental substance, and those two were very different from each other, and you probably know Descartes, you know, did math, Cartesian, you know, geometry. Uh, but if you actually look at, and if you look at Descartes, his theory is actually a much more sort of concrete theory of how the brain works than it's often portrayed. Uh, so, so what was he basing this on? So this, this was kind of like steam engine brain. And so what did Descartes uh, base his analogy on? It's, it's often thought that he based his analogy on a very complicated fountain uh, that um, uh, at uh, the palace of uh, Saint-Germain. And uh, so it was, it was a complex, so there was a complex uh, fountain. It had sort of moving, um, and, you know, uh, So this, this fountain had a little, a bunch of stuff spraying, but the, the, the water was used to sort of drive movements, movements of the fountain. So this was a sort of a fountain brain. <laughs> uh, and, but, and how did it work? So it's, it's very interesting when you actually look at this. So Descartes knew, so there's, there's a famous drawing, you know, it's got a, 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 there's a woman sort of looking out at an arrow, and you can see she's got two eyes, and they're, disturbingly put sort of like side by side <laughs> to each other like that. Um, and, and then, you know, then here's her nose and then uh, you know, the mouth. So uh, there's the, the two eyes like that. Um, and they're looking out at an arrow. Uh, you, you, you probably have seen this, th this picture. So there's an arrow out there. So Descartes knew that uh, the the lens of the eye flip the arrows, you know, so the arrow goes in, it's, it's actually the cornea of the eye that flips it, so it, it goes in and flips the arrow, so he knew that the arrow would sort of be pointing down on the retina. Uh, but then what he had, uh, and uh, he knew it, you know, it went into this, this eye like that as well, so there's another copy of the arrow uh, in that eye, uh, and he kind of screwed up a little bit on the optic chiasm. He drew the optic chiasm like this. You know about the optic chiasm as opposed to crossing, he kind of drew it, drew it, drew it like that. But then where did it go? So it went to this, it went to this, this little uh, structure here, which was like basically a crossbar switch. So how did Descartes think the brain worked? Well, he thought that, th he knew there was a bunch of little wires in here, but he thought of them as little tubes, like little air fountain tubes. And so what was this theory? This theory was basically an, er an early neural net theory of how the brain worked. And so the idea was you had <clears throat> all these two, this giant array of tubes coming in, and then uh, they hit uh, they hit this, you know, structure called the pineal. And so let me draw it a little bit off to the side. So here was the pineal. So the pineal, um, he thought the pineal was somehow, the pineal is a tiny gland that actually has some light-sensitive cells in it, and it's involved in day-night cycles. But uh, I don't know why he focused on the pineal. But how did he think this worked? Well, he thought that uh, the way that, you view things is that images come in, they cause little air puffs to go down through this, through these tubes. Uh, they then get hooked up to the pineal by this crossbar switch that essentially allows you to connect different air tubes to different parts of the pineal. And what decides what gets connected, well, that was the other theory of Descartes, that the mind comes down. So this is the mind is the and the mind is not a physical thing, but the mind comes down, even though it's not physical, and it somehow like decides which uh, 
air tube to connect up to which air tube, but what is the output? So the output was kind of like the fountain idea. So the output was, you know, here you have a hand, uh, hand sort of pointing at the, you know, here's the, that's not a very good thumb, is it? So here's the, here's the curled up hand pointing at the arrow. Uh, so, so how did that work? The idea was that you, you had a, you had a muscle here. So he, you know about muscles. And if you look at your muscle, when you contract your muscle, it looks like it inflates. It doesn't actually, so you, uh, you can just figure this out. They figured it out like a century later. You stick your arm in the water and, you know, move your muscle and the water doesn't go up. So the muscle is not inflating, actually. It's just sort of changing shape. But the idea was that this, um, here's the pineal, uh, that the mind would decide which uh, air tube from the eye to hook up to the pineal and then this would go down and inflate the muscle. This little tube would go down and inflate the muscle, and this, this might you know, inflate some other muscle. So it was basically an early neural network theory of how the brain worked. So don't make fun of it. It was actually sort of like a, it's, it's very far-seeing. It's kind of like a connectionist network. It's like deep learning. <laughs> it's like backprop, so, uh, except with the mind. Uh, so, th so that was Descartes. De Descartes but let's go back even further. So, you know, Descartes was after Aristotle, but let's, let's go back even further. And I always like to talk about this early theory of the brain because at least these theories had some kind of content. So, you know, Descartes saw this fountain and he was sort of trying to make a fountain, but he knew about the optic chiasm. He sort of knew about the pineal. He knew about muscles inflating. You know, Descartes uh, Aristotle, you know, did some dissection, saw all these, you know, blood vessels going up into the, into the brain. But what about if we just have no data? What if we have no data and we just ask, how does the brain work? And this is a very early theory that originally came from the church fathers, from the, f like from St. Augustine, from like 4th century AD. But the drawings of it that you often see are from the 15th, 14th, 15th century. And I've got a nice reading in the, uh, in the, in the readings that is worthwhile looking at that describes this, this theory. And this theory is called the cell doctrine. And I think it's very important to look at what is the theory of the brain in the absence of any data about the brain, about how it works, or what it even looks like. And so you say like, well, why do you want to go all the way back to that? You know, because now we know how the brain works. We should, why are we, why are we doing that? Well, it turns out this theory of how the brain works, which mainly comes from living inside a brain, is actually, is actually still there. It's still how you think the brain works. It, it will come and override your data. It's very, it's very important. It's still, it's, it's a live theory of how the brain works. It's completely wrong, but it doesn't matter. It's how everybody thinks the brain works as a result of living inside of a brain. And so it's important to kind of go back and just see like, you know, what is, what is our base level theory of how the brain works that we have from living inside of a brain um, and, you know, what is it? So we can actually recognize that it's completely wrong, <laughs> completely wrong. Uh, and, you know, how, how can we fight against it? Because it's always there. It's just like sort of a base theory that's always there. So what is this theory? So this theory is, um, so we've got a, a, a head here. So there's a nice, if you, if you go in that, in that reading, you'll see a nice, um, a, a nice article written by Charlie Gross. On, on on the cell doctrine. So here's it's always usually drawn with somebody sticking their tongue out. So here's the person, uh, and and then they've got an ear. Don't forget the ear. And so how how does the cell doctrine work? Well, the first part. Um, so. It, the cells. So, what are the cells? Well, the cells were were conceived of as these ventricles. 
So people, people had a tiny bit of data. So they looked in a brain and they said they saw some holes in the brain. And so these, so these, guys, these guys are the cells. That's what the cell doctrine mean, means. Like there were three ventricles. And what did they think, you know, thought consists of? So if you, th you know, like w if, when you think of like what does thought consist of, it's kind of, it's kind of airy and it's light. It's not, it's not particularly squishy and sort of like biological and bloody. It's kind of, it's like a warp drive. It's like some kind of, some kind of like, you know, gases in there, bright gas is kind of flowing around and doing cognition. That's what they thought was inside these ventricles. It was some kind of sort of gaseous vapor of some kind that was doing cognition. But how did it start? And so when you look at these diagrams, without an explanation, it's kind of hard to sort of like make out what they mean. And so if you look at the diagrams, what you'll see is that there'll be a, a line connecting up like this. So there's a line from the eye, and there's a line from the nose, and there's a line coming from the ear. And they're all going to that, to that central part there. And what is that central part? So that central part is called the common sense. So it's the sensus communis. Common sense. And that's the meaning of the word common sense. Uh, it, what does it mean? It means some kind of base perception of the world that just sort of comes in without too much thought. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of like the ground, the groundwork of um, what you're going to do with cognition on top of it is sort of the base base material coming in. So this is completely wrong. The brain doesn't work this way. Uh, what what happens is you know some visual information comes in. It goes to a bunch of visual areas. They do a bunch of visual stuff. And then there's, a, then there's a bunch of auditory areas, and they're doing a bunch of auditory stuff, and they're almost non-overlapping. Now, there's pathways where information can get back and forth between the modalities, but to a large extent, if you look at the uh, good chunk of the brain, it's most of the information from these different modalities comes in and does a whole bunch of separate processing. So the idea of a common sense where everything sort of comes together into one point, and then your brain cognition warp drive looks at it, is not true, completely not true. It doesn't work that way at all. But so why, why did they think it works this way? Well, you know, you're inside of a brain. It's I, I hear stuff. You know, I'm am sitting there. I'm inside the brain somewhere, a little homunculus, and I, I hear stuff. I see stuff. It's all kind of integrated. You know, I, if I make some noise with my my finger, I look at it. You know, I see that the finger is making noise. I can see the finger moving. It's all it's all sort of unified. So that's, that's, but it's completely wrong, uh, completely wrong. So then what happens? So that's the common sense. And then we go to the first ventricle. And the first, the first ventricle is where you had um, uh, imaginativa and fant fantasia. So you have fantasy and imagination. So what's there? That's like visual imagery. So this is, you imagine things that aren't there in your common sense. Um, and you, uh, fantasy meaning sort of just, you know, imagining some, you know, some, uh, uh, some object that's, that's not there. So that's the first, so, so that's imagery. So we've got, so all the mod modalities come together and then we've got imagery. And then, then what's next? Uh, what's next is cognition. That's the word, cognitiva. So there's cognition and estimation. Estimativa. So, so what's estimation? Estimation is like math. Uh, that, that's math. So that, that's kind of higher level cognition. You know, and then, you know, co cognitiva is kind of thinking about, you know, thinking about higher level, higher level things. Uh, so that's, that's the second one and second ventricle. And then here's the last ventricle. That's memory, of course. Uh, memorativa. And that's the driest ventricle so that your memories won't get moldy. 
so you can keep memories you know, back in there. So this is basically, this is the theory of the brain that doesn't require any data. It's based on just kind of uh, introspection about how your brain works. And um, it's, uh, it's completely wrong. So like me memory is not back in this ventricle. Memory is all the hell all over the place. You know, you've got memory in the superior colliculus. There's some of it in the basal ganglia. There's some down in the cerebellum. There's some in the spinal cord. There's some in the, you know, the dorsal column nuclei. There's, you know, some up, some up in all different parts of the cortex. You know, there's some in the entorhinal cortex. There's probably some in the hippocampus. Um, but it's, it's, it's not like that at all. Uh, but there's a tremendously sort of overwhelming tendency to think of how the brain works uh, from this perspective, this is just sort of the pure thought about how your brain works without any data. And it's important to sort of keep this in mind because it's not just a historical theory. It's still here. That's, that's why I always go over it. It's still here. This is still the way many people think about the brain. And if you interact with the press at all, which I some occasionally have done, a dangerous thing to do, they, of course, think this is the way the brain works. And... Uh, so, um, and it's difficult, you know, since they've already sort of planned out what they're going to say, and you're just supposed to sort of fill in and provide some color and nerdiness. Uh, sometimes it can be a little yeah, push and push, push, shove, shove. But, um, uh, but that's the um, that's the the cell doctrine of the brain. Okay. So in the last two minutes, uh, two minutes, three minutes, uh, I wanted to talk about some other kind of. Uh, Things that people often, you know, say like, you know, do you only use 10% of your brain? You know, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, nobody ever said that. It's kind of like it's kind of like the six-foot rule for staying away from COVID. Like, wh where did where did that come from? <laughs> Was there ever a study study of that? Uh, no, not, not really. Um, so the the 10% of the brain. I always say that this is this is kind of just the the general feeling that you could do better if you tried harder. <laughs> so, you know, the average person is not trying very hard, and so they're not using much of their brain. Uh, generally, you know, you use all of your brain. It's not, uh, it, it's just a nonsense thing that just comes up. But it's, it, it's kind of like one of these things. It's just like, you know, if you just only tried harder, you could do better. <laughs> um, but what about, you might have heard of the, the smell brain or the reptilian brain. Uh, so where does, you know, or, or the reptilian brain, you know, where did that come from? Uh, that's also just one of these just sort of made up things. Um, so if you take a reptile like a turtle, I've actually worked on turtles sometimes. You look at what's in a turtle brain. They've got a smell part and they've got the visual cortex and they've got the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus and they've got like a touch part. You know, they can feel their shell if you touch their shell. Uh, they've got an auditory system. They they can't hear really high frequencies, but they can, you know, recognize which harbor they're coming into by the sound of the waves in the harbor. You know, they got like a good... They have all the different parts of the brain, pretty much the same parts of the brain that uh, that mammals have. There's really no radical difference. They don't... They're not really reptilian. There's no... And so, so what does this come from? Well, that's just... It's kind of like this Freudian idea that there's some deep smell, sex, you know, drives, you know, uh, thing underneath there. And, and then we've got like some cognition part on top. Uh, but that's not true. Reptiles already, yeah, reptiles already had all, there is no smell brain. There never was a smell brain. There, there, is, no, there is no reptilian brain. It's pretty much the same. Then finally, just talk about, you know, some of the big differences. So a lot of people look at left-right differences. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with looking at left-right differences in the brain. Uh, there's differences between the left and the right hemisphere. They're overwhelmingly similar in their basic layout and their, and their connections. And they, they're overwhelmingly functionally equivalent if you start early enough. So an example is if, you, if you've got some epilepsy happening in your left hemisphere, and enterprising uh, brain surgeons have decided to remove the entire hemisphere, which they do sometimes in, in very young kids. So you can take the entire hemisphere out, the left hemisphere out. And if, you, if this person develops, 
they'll have language. And there'll be some slight impairments in language, but they can easily develop language completely in the right hemisphere. So there's nothing super special about the left hemisphere versus the right hemisphere, and they're mostly, di they're mostly the same. Um, the problem with these kinds of studies is that you know, you've got 400 parts of the brain on the left half of the brain and 400 parts on the right half of the brain. Uh, and that's hard. Like trying to think about how 400 parts interact with each other, oh man, that's a ter terrible mess. But taking the left and the right part of the brain that are mirror images of each other and looking for small differences between them, that's easy. So I'm not against left-right differences, but just always like put on your skeptical hat when you, when you come across it because you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a way of avoiding the problem. <laughs> the problem is the 400 parts and how do they work? And the same thing you have with sex differences. So, you know, if you look at the differences between a male and a female brain, they're very, very minor, very minor. Most of them are related to the size of the body because your brain scales with, with body size. So there are differences uh, between, uh, between different sexes. I'm not denying that. But again, it's the same thing. It's like our problem is how do we understand like these 400 parts interacting with each other versus just something that we can easily turn into kind of like a binary thing, like left, left versus right. So, so that pretty much, uh, um, uh, again, I'm not against studying sex differences in the brain. I'm just saying, you know, it, there's still the 400 part problem. You still got that. Okay, so, so I'm pretty much uh, reached, reached one hour. And so, um, uh, if anybody's still on Zoom, uh, after we end the recording, we, we, can, um, uh, we, we can chat a little bit. And uh, the plan is see you uh, Friday at 9 a.m., no 8 a.m. lecture uh, on Friday.